the Clean River Campaign. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for our seventh Beyond Tunnel Vision Good Jobs in Green Communities speaker series. And uh, we're excited that you could all join us, especially those of you who are sharing your amazing uh, green infrastructure projects with us tonight. As many of you have been with us through this whole series, you know that we've brought um, experts from regions all over the country to talk to us about green infrastructure, the leadership that their communities have toward uh, more sustainable solutions to stormwater uh, problems. And we've heard from people from Syracuse, New York, DC, Cincinnati, Portland, really all over the country. And we're excited to be back after a little summer break to bring you projects from the Pittsburgh region. So this is an exciting night and I'm glad you could all be here to join us. One thing that has really stuck out to me over the course of those presentations is that what those uh, regions really had are to get started were knowledge and leadership. And those are two important things and I'm so happy again that people could be here to share the knowledge and leadership that's already happening in our community on the projects that are already going into the ground. So I hope you'll check all those out if you haven't had a chance yet. I know many of you have. Um, and we're excited to just continue to see that leadership develop and grow in our community. And to that end, I'd like to introduce Councilman Bill Peduto, who will be introducing our uh, speaker series tonight and just saying a few words. Welcome. Thanks, Jennifer. I got to go home and change and shower. And I, I, I thought I'd feel refreshed, I feel exhausted still. Somehow that shower thing isn't working anymore. Hey, um, I just want to go through this so you understand how important it is that you're here. Um, we've got like a once in three lifetimes opportunity to do this right. And usual, politics as usual, how you do something right is get the cost up high, find the favored vendor and contractors and the firms to be able to do it. And when you're building airports or you're building huge infrastructure pro projects, you build political empires because there's lots of money. And that's the way, you know, around this country things got done. Let's be real clear about it. It happened right here for decades. Now, when we talk about doing it right, we're not really talking about doing it right for the environment. We're talking about breaking those shackles of an old political machine that was all about making sure that this engineering firm got the work and made this much money and they raised the money for these candidates and this happened and everything else. You're in the middle of this. It's very real. It's a very real battle. And with what, what is the critical part of it is people. That's how you defeat it. So let's look a little bit about what we're talking about and why this war is so important. We have an opportunity to rebuild Pittsburgh neighborhoods. And we can use the funds that are part of this project in order for neighborhoods that haven't seen anything for 50 years to have investment made in them. We can take right down the street in Homewood in areas that we have vast property and start to build parks where there are no parks. And you know what happens to housing values when they're next to parks? They go up. You know what happens when you have parks? People want to move there. And you start to build infrastructure that's not just a great pipe that's going to a big company that does work all around the world, but you employ people from neighborhoods to rebuild their neighborhoods, and you make that part of the price tag. We're going to put this part in and take that one big pipe we're going to need out. And then we can start to look at all the industrial sites along the rivers, big flat areas down on the north side around Chateau and over in Lawrenceville down by the Heppenstall plant, and in Hazelwood. Again, places that haven't seen development. And instead of burying big, huge pipes the size of this room underneath those neighborhoods, we can daylight them and make canals where housing and other development starts to be built around it, where people want to say, we want to invest in Chateau. We want to be a part of Manchester and a, really an, a, an operation that can help to rebuild a community there as well and we can employ the people in those communities to have an opportunity for a decade on the jobs. That is what you're fighting for. Sure, the pictures look pretty, but there's a whole fundamental shift on how we invest your money and how we do it in a way that is good for the profitability of this region because infrastructure is needed 
Nobody wants to live in a city where raw sewage runs through the rivers, where it's good to the people, because we can use it as an economic development tool to employ people and to have them have a say within their own neighborhoods and basically rebuild neighborhoods that haven't been redeveloped and how it's good for the planet. How we do it in a way that makes Pittsburgh an example where cities all around this country and all around the world look and say, why can't we be more like them? You are on the front line. You are the people that are the messengers of this message. And trust me, in hushed tones behind closed doors, there's a whole lot of people coming in from around the country and around the world who'd like to do it another way. And that's why it's important that there are people that are backing it and standing up. So I wanted to stop by today just to say thank you. Uh, you've got some big work to do. Uh, I think we can do it. I really do. We've got about one year. It's about the time frame. Because this plan needs to be implemented by 2026. Which means we're going to have to start putting shovels in the ground by 2016. Which means next year, 2014, we got to put all of this together, make it the plan for the PWSA, the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, and then make sure that Alcasan is listening and makes it a part of their plan. And then we got to work throughout the communities around Allegheny County and ask them to join us with it. If you gave people the opportunity to choose what they would want, big septic tanks under the neighborhoods of the city of Pittsburgh or a green proposal that helps to rebuild neighborhoods favorable to the environment and daylights that they'll all choose this. So important work getting done tonight, folks. Just wanted to come by to say thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, introduce Skip Schwab from East Liberty Development. He'll be talking about the project that is right outside um, East Liberty Presbyterian, right here. You might have seen the fences as you were coming in. And he'll be talking a little bit about that and the East Liberty plan, uh, Green Plan. So, uh, with that, Skip. Welcome. Uh, when Jennifer asked me to uh, speak, uh, I actually laughed because I really don't know any of the technical details of what goes into uh, a stormwater mitigation project. And she assured me that I would not have to. Now you may wonder how I could be the project manager of a project and not know anything about stormwater management. That's the beauty of working for a nonprofit community-based organization. The uh, staff person that we had, our sustainability manager, the beloved Nate Wildfire, uh, who created this idea, has moved on to the great state of, of Vermont. So either I wasn't paying attention in a staff meeting or they decided I could handle this project. I will say that, that there is a pattern here because the last project I inherited was another crazy underfunded project that was the pedestrian bridge over by the whole Whole Foods Market that our also beloved Rob Stephanie had created before he left. So I guess I need to come up with a crazy project. But anyway. Uh, I want to talk about very briefly about why a community group did get involved in, in a green stormwater managed mitigation project. And the reason is it came from our uh, 1999 community plan, which there it is. Um, in 1999, we did a community outreach. We did about an 18 month, 24 month process engaging all of the business owners, uh, stakeholders, and, and we, we also talked to the residents, uh, including the renters. Uh, and while they may not have talked in terms of green and sustainability, they certainly did say that, that, that they needed improvements to the parks, to pedestrian access and things. So after that, uh, we then um, started to work on uh, actual town square projects because it came out of the community plan that there was a desire to have a central place, a, a social plaza for for the community. And it focused around uh, the East Liberty Press Virginia Church, which uh, as Rob Stephanie had said, if, if this church was in Europe, it would be surrounded by storefronts and vendors and a lot of public activity. 
and instead it was a somewhat sterile, rather uninviting, pedestrian, lacking facility. So we, we went through uh, a community planning effort uh, in 2005. Since I work for a uh, community group, you'll, you'll understand um, that our process is slow. Uh, so in 2007, uh, we started to build upon the community plan in the town square, and we created uh, a, a green vision, an overlay for, uh, the, for the community. And then finally, uh, that led to, and there, and there it is. Again, it's a pretty simple idea. It's starting to connect uh, the assets which, which a community has. And then eventually in 2010, we, uh, we redid our community plan. Took another eight, 18 month process um, and, and reaffirmed uh, the, the idea for creating a town a town square. And, and again, uh, while, while the residents may not have been using the terminology, they, they certainly did talk, talk about the importance of green projects, of sustainability, and this idea of creating a, a, town, a town square, uh, which then leads to our, our project itself. Uh, these are just some of the principles that came out of, of the community plan as well as our and then this, this is the community, uh, the vision for the town, the town square. Um, it started initially as a green landscaping project, and then it evolved into a storm, a storm water mitigation. So we will be capturing the first inch, inch of rain as, as it comes off the church, and doing all kinds of crazy technical stuff that I do not understand. But it's, but it's interesting to know that if, if you go out now, you'll see uh, they're just starting to create the, uh, the weeping wall. Uh, and they're using some of the reclaimed uh, stone that came from the Ellsworth Avenue pedestrian bridge. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, we're talking about, about, again, more of the landscaping and creating a plaza. So, so we spent a lot of time uh, figuring out the landscaping strategy, the trees, the plantings, and then finally the lighting. Because again, if you go to the next slide, um, we, we wanted to be able to make sure that this, this was, again, not, not only a green place, not only a place where for uh, people to gather, but also it was safe and a well and a well lit environment. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. has appeared. I think he had a family emergency, so unfortunately we won't be able to hear about the Homestead, Munhall, and West Homestead Green Alley project, but I hope we can highlight that at a future event. In the meantime, I'll take just one minute to recognize the other elected officials who could be with us. I know I saw Daryl Rapp, who's from Swiss Vale. Are you out there? Okay. Thanks for being with us and leading your in the right, right direction. Um, and I know that there's a representative here from um, Councilman O'Connor's office. I don't know if, uh, yeah, thank you for being with us. As well as a representative from Congressman Doyle's office. So thanks, I don't know where, I can't see you, but I know you're around here. Oh, back there. <laughs> thank, thank you to all of you for being with us and for um, uh, leading your constituencies toward green infrastructure. Um, did I miss anybody? I don't wanna. You miss anybody? Okay. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, the next uh, group we'll be hearing about, we actually have three presenters um, <clears throat> from Mil who will be talking about projects in Millville, and I'll let them introduce themselves. For you come on up, and I'll get your presentation all set up. While you introduce yourself. Uh, so my name is Mara Massini. I work with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, specifically on the Tree Vitalized Project. And my name is Denise Rudart. I'm a co-chairperson with the Community Gardens, and I work with the Belleville Borough Development Corporation. And this is John Stephen. 
<laughs> John Stephen, Executive Director of the Three Rivers Waterkeeper. Um, there we are. So we're all kind of getting together to talk about um, a lot of projects going on. We have a limited amount of time to cover them all, so we're only going to touch on a couple. Um, and this all focuses in the Gurdjieff Run watershed. So uh, there's many key players for just a few. So um, Jennifer, do you want to go ahead? Um, our greening efforts that I can go back in history talking to people started with our gap park. There was a, an empty lot, I just felt like um, Councilman Peduto talked about, taking an empty lot. It was in the middle of the business district. It wasn't blighted. It was just ignored, overgrown weeds. And we decided to make it into a, a pocket park, we called it, and just put in, um, just cleaned it up. Um, we're and still trying to finish it. Actually, we're putting up fencing now. And there's trees planted. In fact, this is it right here. But this has now become home to a farmer's market that happens every Wednesday um, from May until November. It is a community food bank farmer's market. And um, it also has become home to movies once a month in the summer to kids that come down there. And they'll have 100 kids coming into that park. It's just phenomenal. It's next to an ice cream store. It's next to Attic Records and a French bakery, so it's used. And it's really neat because it looks so much better than it did. From there then, just from taking that empty lot, we took another empty lot and made a community garden. And then from there, a few parking spaces got torn up to make a rain garden. And it just, it kept spiraling. Now there's an orchard in another empty lot. And this year our orchard was able to give blackberries to the farmer's market and sell them there. So we're starting to see some sustainability going on there. And we're trying to implement a program where people bring their compost from the things they purchase at the farmer's market back to the farmer's market so that we can take it back to the gardens and put it back into the soil in the gardens. Um, from there, we also have a rain garden at the library. And the library is very supportive. Of course, our library just opened this year. So there was a group of people working to get this library together, working on all these greening efforts. So there's this really neat core of people that are coming together to really fix up the town and to do it the right way and take care of the waterfront also and the watershed. And from, so now we're up to two rain gardens, the orchard, and we just expanded our gardens again this year. And now we're talking about putting in a greenhouse to extend the growing season, to supply farmer's market, possibly restaurants in the area. And it just keeps going and going and going. And one of the best community benefits from all of this is that you get noticed. I mean, people are starting to move into town because they said, this is really cool. We want to be here. We have businesses that are coming in and want to develop in these old buildings that were flooded, that have been sitting there for years with nobody in them. And then there's people like Tree Vitalize. This whole Tree Vitalize project was because they saw all the greening events that were happening saying, we know if we come in there, you will welcome us and help us get this project going. And we did. And so it really does just keep on going. It keeps going. It's worth it. And that leads us to Tree Vitalize. Um, so on the next slide, um, I'm going to touch briefly on the Tree Vitalize project. This started um, as a grant from PetFest in 2012. Uh, it's due to be complete this December. Uh, it involves planting over 800 trees in the borough of Millville. And Millville is less than a square mile. Uh, it's not a very great big town, but it is a warm and welcoming community. I know I, I personally grew up in Millville, which is kind of ironic that I'm now working on the project there. But I've made friends with Denise and a lot of the other members throughout this project, and it's been great. Um, so along with those 800 some trees, 300 of those are large-scale bald, bald and burlap trees that we're planting throughout the business district and along the riverfront park, as well as hundreds of smaller restoration trees in various areas along the riverfront and things like that. So um, there's also two bioswales that we're putting in up at the Mount Alvernia property. So I don't know if you're familiar with Millville, but Mount Alvernia kind of sits <coughs> on a hill above Millville, and um, it's a big green space, and the sisters have been very welcoming, working with us on these two bioswales. Um, one is complete right now, so if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this is kind of an eagle's eye view. You'll see Evergreen <coughs> Road on the bottom left. There's one bioswale going on Hawthorne Road, and that one is about 400 feet long. If you check out our poster, it kind of shows the site plan. There's a smaller one going in their parking lot, which will capture a little bit less than an acre of stormwater from one of their buildings in their parking lots. Hawthorne Road, I think, drains about 
11 acres of water will channel through that area. So if you go to the next slide, this kind of shows the impervious surface. So the big black one in the center, um, if you hit the mouse twice more, they'll kind of label where they are. Uh, these are the buildings on Mount Alvernia, the graves, all the roads, houses in the, in the bottom area. But this is kind of the, the area we're working in. Um, I think if you go to the next slide, this picture on the left is showing Hawthorne Road, where the first bioswale was installed. If you advance one more, it's kind of like a uh, series of pictures. It was construction. This is what it looks like now. It was just complete. Um, and currently, we have the North Area Environmental Council applied for a grant through the Allegheny Conservation District for a monitoring system. So we're in the process of installing that. We'll be able to monitor how much water goes in here at the start and how much is at the end. And this is tied into the stormwater system, uh, the storm sewer, so whatever it can't capture, it'll just go right back into the storm drain like it were if this bioswell was not here. Um, and on October 9th, you're all welcome to join us, but we are having an event. We got Hawthorne Road closed down. We're all gonna hang out outside around this bioswell and celebrate. Um, so if you hit the slide one more time, this is the area up in the parking lot where the other bioswale is going in. Uh, again, it's smaller, it's still under construction right now, so when you come to the event on October 9th, you can see the finished product. Um, and Thank you, Moira. Um, Three Rivers Waterkeeper, we're not building any one particular specific project, but what I'd like to, uh, to think we're doing is we're building uh, an environment, a vision, where projects like this become more commonplace and more of, you know, early, developed earlier on in the infrastructure planning process. Um, as uh, Councilman Peduto mentioned, we have a, like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity here with the major infrastructure investment, but we have really a, a lifetime of work to start to implement that and ideally try to work to restore many of these wonderful urban streams we have. So uh, Three Rivers Waterkeeper is starting to develop a, uh, a rapid visual watershed assessment program, working with uh, uh, Allegheny Cleanways and other partners to get people out and take a close look at these uh, urban streams and these resources, and in a sense, sort of develop a, a user's manual so that the citizens can work with the engineers that can work with the municipal officials to come up with uh, you know, long-term plans to, to bring some of these, uh, these streams back to life. Um, for the next one. And why did we uh, select uh, Securities Run to get started? Well, I think you know, these are two wonderful examples. There are a lot of exciting and uh, very active volunteers that are out there uh, greening up uh, portions of, of their uh, watershed. But what we want to do is to continue that momentum that, uh, and to expand that up into, uh, farther up into the stream and to work towards uh, a watershed approach to the uh, to Gertie's Run restoration. And Gertie's Run, in, in reality, have the benefits and the struggles that are really uh, emblematic of urban streams. Some wonderful hillsides, some wonderful green space, and the stream is open for most of its uh, most of its uh, you know, stretch through uh, through Ross and Millville and Shaler. But it still remains very hard to touch. But uh, and then of course it has stretches of uh, overdevelopment, and that leads to flash flooding, erosion issues and you know, sort of the, uh, the trash collection areas. And we really want to start to get people to, uh, uh, to consider how we can eliminate those. So we're excited to, um, to get started uh, doing uh, an assessment of Gertie's Run, but we're looking to uh, opportunities to replicate that throughout uh, Allegheny County so that we could really um, use and uh, target this investment for some exciting urban restoration projects. So this is just all of our contact information. Um, thank you for having us, Jenny and everyone else. Um, we're really excited to talk about this work, and if you want to see anything else, the table's right back there. Um, we have our cards and the information on all kinds of stuff, so come and talk to us. Thanks.
Thanks so much. That's a lot of project happening in a very small space. It's very exciting. Um, I'd like to welcome next uh, Sarah Thompson and Nancy Roman from Pashtek Associates to talk about some of the uh, projects they've implemented and some that they've designed that they're still working on. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm here mostly to, to talk about projects, in a, um, several different projects, I guess. Um, this one is um, up on the north side, uh, the King School. The uh, Allegheny Commons, in Commons Initiative and Western Pennsylvania Conservancy got together and uh, wanted to do a, a greening project for a school on the north side. And um, we came in and we talked with the students and the teachers and we were asking them what they wanted. Um, part of this project also was to kind of uh, expand the playground interpretive aspects of it. Um, so this, I don't have a laser pointer, but um, on the left hand side is uh, basically a, a sidewalk that goes between the green side, which is a ball, existing ball field, and then the school on the left. Um, this kind of sidewalk corridor um, not only uh, is, a, is a pathway for the kids, but it's also a pathway between uh, the hospitals. So the um, General Hospital and uh, basically Allegheny Center. A lot of people come through this space. So we wanted to make it fun and interactive with kids, but also you know, try to uh, teach some people who are walking through the area you know, about um, rain gardens and stormwater and also beneficial pollinators and, and that kind of thing. So, the sidewalk, you see kind of those, um, there's butterflies and there's bees on it. And so these, we thought, well, you know, just simple paint, paint them on the ground. Um, it's cheap, it's easy to do. Um, you can use uh, these uh, paintings to kind of uh, formulate some of the, some games. So like Foursquare, we designed a little butterfly drawing that has a Foursquare court in it. Um, and, um, the, the main part, the greening part, I guess, uh, up along the upper right-hand corner, um, is a planting plan for a rain garden. And basically all we did was, um, all we proposed, is to um, lift up some of the concrete. Um, so there's um, two parcels on the, or two green, green spots on the left-hand side of the plan up there. Um, that is basically, currently there's two existing trees there. And they're basically surrounded like, by concrete. Well, let's free these trees up um, and make some and plant some native plants. Um, and then on the right hand side um, of the planting plant up there is, is um, the rain gardens. And currently, there is an asphalt swale there. So when they put in the ball field and uh, the, the sidewalk um, to capture the stormwater, they created a, an asphalt swale into a, an existing outlet. Or in the, and so we thought, well, you know, why can't we capture this before it gets to the, the inlet? And so we just removed some of the asphalt, or are planning to remove some of the asphalt, and um, create uh, two rain, gar rain gardens there. And all the plants that um, are suggested for this is, uh, are sensory plants. There's, you know, things that the kids can eat. There's, you know, blueberries. Um, there'll be um, plants that the kids will touch, and um, plants that, you know, we can talk about pollinators. Um, so that is that project. You can go to the next slide. This is actually two different projects. Um, on the left hand side is the can you convention hold the center. Microphone a little closer oh. to your mouth? Sorry? <laughs> How's that? Um, on the left hand side is the uh, convention center, uh, Green Roof. And this project kind of came about because some people over at the Sports um, Exhibition Authority um, had the forethought to say, hey, you know, we've got a great opportunity here. And I think this all started because there was a leak, a leak, a leak on the roof. Um, so originally they, they hired somebody to fix the leak, to redo the roof. Um, but somebody, um, Angelica was a big part of it, um, said, you know, let's do a green roof while we're ripping this thing up and fixing this, you know, we might as well do a green roof. And so um, the, uh, the convention center, you know, they, they said they wanted um, an event space, uh, a space for basically, you know, they could have um, cocktails out there, they could have um, banquets out there. And so that's kind of the, the white space you see in the middle. And, um, and then we have this 
kind of blue river looking thing. So we wanted to make it kind of easy and, uh, for people to realize, you know, this is about stormwater. Um, so this blue path kind of meanders through um, the uh, uh, through the roof. Um, and this roof, by the way, is about a, fo a football field length. So it's pretty long. It's 22,000 square feet. Um, and on the uh, right hand side of the roof is um, sedum. Um, so those are kind of what people typically um, think of when they think of a green roof. They're really easy to grow. They're succulents. Um, and we want to kind of contrast that between your typical green roof and what um, a native meadow would look like. And so on the left hand side is um, a native meadow. On the right hand side of the slide is the Allegheny County Office building green roof. Um, that one's a little harder to get to. The, the green roof on the convention center is, is accessible, um, easy to get to. Um, and the one on the right hand side for the um, Allegheny County, um, this initiative was started um, by Dan Alvarado and I know Darla Cravada, who wish she could be here, she might be late, um, wish she could um, talk about this, but so this was kind of her one of her first projects here. Um, but the um, for this roof, uh, basically it was a demonstration. So this was done um, 2010. Yeah, 2009 or 2010. Forget. Um, but what the county wanted to do was they wanted to um, hold a demonstration green roof and talk about um, the different types of green roofs that you can have. So if people were interested in doing a green roof, they could go up there. Um, Darla will has the key and let you in, um, and you can really see what kinds of you know green roofs that are up there. They've got um, some monitoring equipment that monitors how much rainwater each of these different types of green roofs um, captures. So on the county uh, green roof, there there's an intensive green roof that's about uh, 10 inches of growing, growing soil. Medium. So We've got, we planted um, several different types of shrubs um, and other plants that, you know, can grow in, in thick soil. And all the way down to a four inch um, soil medium um, with sedums. There's also a tray system, um, which is basically pre-vegetated trays that you have set on there. Um, and if anybody's interested in some of the data, wants to learn more about it, they Google Allegheny County office building green roof. Um, it's one of the first links that you can, uh, that you can see. Um, I was going to actually, oops, can you hear me, um, reiterate what, what Sarah said about the, the county the office building, roof. the county office building green roof. Um, you see it in the upper right, actually the upper right and the lower right. And, and again, it was a mixture throughout the roof of different types of green roofs. So again, it went anywhere from the, the tray system, which was obvious, to the intensive, which was the, the thickest. And it allowed us to sort of experiment with a lot of different plants that people would say, well, gee, does that work on a green roof? I don't know, let's try it. So that was sort of this demonstration so that other property owners could see you know, what does work and what doesn't work. Because in, in our case, in the county office building, this is on the sixth floor roof, which we, um, which was wonderful for us in the way this building was designed because it actually was designed for another floor. So that allowed us to do these rather deep, um, you know, intensive soil depths and do things like shrubs that you might not normally see, like bayberry, I think is in the background, and some other um, uh, perennials that would take that, you know, deeper soil that would do well. So that allowed us to do that. Not all roofs have that have that structure to be able to support that. So again, we did this sort of range. We even had some areas that had vines growing to screen a, a utility structure. So it, it's really an interesting thing. It's kind of a wild looking thing, and I'm sure it's much denser now. This picture was taken a couple of years ago. Um, but again, it's it's something worth seeing to see, you know, different types of roofs in, in one fairly small space. It was probably at least a third the size of, I think that, yeah, or even less than a third the size of the convention center. So that, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. That's it.
Uh, James Stitt uh, from PWSA, Sustainability Manager from Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, will be uh, our last speaker, and he'll be talking a little bit about uh, implementing integrated watershed planning, and I'm sure he'll explain what that is, <laughs> uh, that PWSA is working on and really trying to take um, their service area in a greener direction. So, James, welcome. Thank you. Um, Well, while she's doing that, um, let me just start to say thank you very much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here and explain, help try to explain to you some of the things that we're doing at PWSA to get uh, green infrastructure um, going and rolling along. Um, as some of you may be aware, on July 31st, PWSA submitted our wet weather feasibility study to the Department of Environmental Protection, PA, and the County Health Department. And um, in that submittal, uh, was a chapter that we call Chapter 9 or Section 9, which is our green infrastructure chapter that was uh, basically fed by a lot of the information we gathered at the three charrettes that we held earlier this spring on green infrastructure. Um, this chapter lays out a basic plan for PWSA to implement green infrastructure for stormwater management and for uh, some of those of you who have not quite downloaded it yet from our website or had a chance to look at Chapter 9 or our feasibility study, um, all 30 pounds of it. Uh, I'll give you a little brief rundown of what, uh, what that chapter looks like. So, um, first of all, our primary goals for this uh, integrated watershed planning and green infrastructure at PWSA is uh, to help us identify the optimal combination of green and gray. We know, you know, we're, we want to do as much green as we can, but there's, got, there's some kind of balance here where we, we have to find this hybrid solution. Um, and this will help allow us to do that. Second thing, we want to demonstrate these benefits of using an adaptive management approach, which is uh, a way of putting stuff in the ground, testing it out, seeing what works, coming back, using what worked, getting rid of what didn't, changing for the next uh, coming um, section of the plan. Hopefully, uh, you know, as uh, Mr. Peduto alluded to, we can become a regional leader and, and help guide some of the, the, the other thoughts and processes that municipalities will use on this. And finally, at the end of all this, you know, we want to, within the next several years, revise our wet weather feasibility study so that we can include more green infrastructure once we find out what's going to work here in Pittsburgh for us and what we can justify to the uh, regulators as being valid ideas. Um, that we can incorporate into a revised uh, consent order. So this adaptive management approach, it's a, a based on a, a four-year plan, and year one is our building support section. What we want to do here is try to garner as much support as we can for this green infrastructure stuff, and we've already begun to do that. We've done that a lot. Looking at the crowd here, we, we can see a, a lot of the uh, folks that we need to have on board. Um, we need to coordinate with our regulators, making sure that they're okay with this. If uh, you know, we don't want to pursue something that is going to get turned down by them or not be recognized as a as a viable option for stormwater management in our in the uh, regulations. So, so as I said, some of these things we've already done. Um, the Green Infrastructure Technical Advisory Committee. We've already started working with a group of people. There's several of them are here tonight. To uh, from the community, from the different green infrastructure organizations, uh, policy folks, as well as uh, the technical and um, landscape and environmental folks to help advise us on what we need to do and how, how to pro best approach this. Um, and we've initiated some early demonstration projects like our partnership with uh, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, Alcasan, uh, EPA, and Public Works on the, the Shenley Park project. Um, some things we're, we're also working with Three Rivers Wet Weather on um, some, some other uh, design projects as well. Years two and three are the technical justification period. During that time, uh, is uh, the, the more shovels in the ground uh, period that uh, Mr. Peduto talked about earlier. That's where you know, we'll begin to put these ideas out and get things in the ground. Um, and, and including that as a key portion of it, this stage is uh, the measurement and monitoring and verification of the green infrastructure so that we can go back to the regulators with defensible Pittsburgh data. So we can say, we're doing this, we tried this, it worked here, not just 
it's working in other cities because they, they had already asked us to provide Pittsburgh data. Um, and then year four is our final step on this stage, and that's the performance merit revision, that, that the performance that we've uh, discovered merits a revision of our um, what, whether feasibility study and the consent order and agreement that we have. Um, so we will go back to our regulators and hopefully get that revised so that we can include much more green infrastructure um, so that they're asking us to include this stuff rather than us trying to force them to let us do this stuff. Um, and one of the things that we want to include in that is this integrated watershed planning um, component that some of you may have heard about. I, I should hope EPA has made some um, inroads with you know, getting the word out on this and, and have, has issued a framework that municipalities can follow to use integrated watershed planning. And basically what that is, next please, what that is is a um, way of approaching watershed stormwater management on a sort of wholesale system-wide level, looking at not just quantities of water that's coming out the outfalls like our consent order now has us uh, regulated into managing the flows. This also looks at water quality issues that are controlled by things like um, you know, pollution control permits and uh, other out outfall controls and flooding issues in certain areas. Uh, so rather than trying to address each one of those as a separate issue and spending some money on pollution controls and cleaning up the water, spending some money on flood you know, repairs and controls and spending some money on uh, reducing outfalls, this allows us to take those as a lump, look at them all together and use things like green infrastructure to address them as a whole in the watershed. Uh, one of the areas that we're going to start to do this and what we've selected is the sawmill run watershed. Those little blobs are just sort of indicators of where things might be placed. It may be a good idea. None of those have been vetted, so if your neighborhood, your street, or your corner block is not indicated there, please don't think we won't be doing something there. Um, the reason we selected Sawmill Run is because it's somewhat of a microcosm of the city of Pittsburgh uh, as far as topography, hydrology, the multi-municipal neighborhoods that are on the outer edges that we have to deal with. Um, integrated watershed planning doesn't stop at the Pittsburgh border. It includes those outlying communities that we'll, we'll be needing to work with. So uh, we're hoping to you know, use this single shed as a demonstration for what can be done throughout the rest of the city and what can be done throughout the rest of Pittsburgh. The other reason is that uh, the majority of the PWSA owned and the outfalls that we're responsible for are in this shed. The rest of the city has, uh, we, ha we do have several out dispersed throughout the rest of the city, but the majority of the outfalls along the Allegheny, Ohio and, and uh, Monongahela rivers are technically res the responsibility of Alcasan and not necessarily ours. Uh, this integrated watershed planning process that I said is something that we hope to take to the rest of the city and use it in the other different watersheds. And here you can see some of those other sheds um, beyond the city limits and how far they stretch out and some of the other communities that we are hoping that we can form these partnerships with and bring them into um, working with us so that we're all working on a similar plan and not on separate plans uh, in, in different ways. And, um, one of the things in the Clean Water Act is that it does allow for the flexibility in, uh, in for us to implement things like integrated watershed planning. Um, and this approach does uh, have the potential for us to identify a, a prioritized critical path as we move forward so that we can then you know, approach these uh, on that holistic level, like I said before. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Uh, one of the things that PWSA has decided is that we will form a dedicated team within our ranks. Um, as you can see, this is sort of a loose org chart of ours where we have you know, a sustainability department that's housed under engineering that does impact some of the other areas around it. And next please, as we move forward, we'll expand that to include a green infrastructure program manager as well as a green infrastructure technical coordinator. So we want to have some dedicated staff that will be working specifically on these um, 
issues around stormwater, managing stormwater with green infrastructure. And next, please, the uh, program manager, their duties will fall into the, the category of more like a cat herder. Basically, they're going to be you know, the face of the program, going out there, organizing other communities, other agencies, um, and all the multiple groups that need to be gathered to work together on these green infrastructure projects. As we're finding out, uh, working with Aaron at the Parks Conservancy in Alcasan um, on this uh, Shenley Park project, there are so many different levels and agencies involved uh, that it can get unwieldy sometimes in the room. So we need somebody that can uh, handle that sort of thing. Um, the technical coordinator is, is a much, going to be a much more technical position, of course, and that person will do a lot of the shovels in the ground type stuff that I mentioned earlier and help uh, try to vet some of these projects as we go uh, forward, finding the appropriate siting, location, uh, most effective use of a particular BMP in a particular area, and that sort of thing. And then finally, um, in PWSA's uh, capital budget for 2014, we have included, you know, the, for the next three or four years, we have included these items um, to these levels. These are just numbers that, you know, we're projecting. We may spend more, um, but as you can see in year one, you know, it's uh, the setup phase, years two and three, the large cost there related to, you know, construction and implementation, monitoring, data collection and verification, and then hopefully by year four, we can come back to the regulators and um, show them that you know we're serious about this stuff. So I thank you all for your time and I appreciate it. Thanks, James. Um, I don't know if our presenters would mind taking a few questions, if anybody has a question they'd like to ask about any other projects that are out there? Any questions? Or you can talk with them individually at um, their posters in the back. They take yours. Well, you can check them out and talk with them individually in the back. But uh, I think you heard here that there are um, many green projects going in the ground, in development. Uh, we're getting ready to uh, do even more in um, the Alcacian service area and the PWSA service area. Uh, there are a lot of creative partnerships happening. There are a lot of creative ways to finance these projects. And uh, as Councilman Peduto alluded, you know, this is our money and we should uh, all care about how this money gets invested. So thanks for being here and for being a part of this. And I hope you have a little more chance to mingle. And uh, we also have an action at the Clean Rivers campaign table over here where we are uh, doing a postcard campaign uh, to the EPA. So stop by and sign a postcard. And uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you.